I invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles, your Bible apps, and turn to the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is where we're going to be today. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1,122 and you will find our text for the day. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then take one of these with you. Seriously, it's our gift to you because we want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Uh, So what is the best news that you could get today? What's something you're hoping for, longing for, dreaming about, praying for, that uh, if, if it happened today, you would go, this is good news to me. This is good news to my family. Uh, What's the good news? I don't need to know it, uh, but share it with someone around you. You got 30 seconds. What's good news that you could hear today? Ready, set, go. Yeah, it's been interesting, as, I, as I've done this now in three services, uh, how unexcited the good news you guys are sharing with each other would be. <laughs> I really thought there'd be a lot of fun, a lot of people, you know, have, and, and it's just kind of a quiet little thing. I don't know if we're, we're uh, afraid that we won't get good news or what, but uh, so what would be your good news? That you got the job, that you qualified for the college scholarship, you got the big promotion at work, you won the lottery. What would be the good news? Would it, would it be that you're getting married, that your marriage is reconciled, that your child is coming home, that you're going to be parents or grandparents? What would be the good news? It isn't cancer? That, uh, you know, the cancer is in remission? That your child is healed? That your friend or your loved one came to faith in Jesus? See, there's lots of things that qualify as good news. Today, I want to share with you the best news ever. And the best news is this. We've got great news. There is no condemnation. Great news. There is no condemnation. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Rome. And we're picking up at chapter 8, verse 1, just the first four verses. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free. And in Jesus Christ, from the law of sin and death, for God has done what the law, weakened by flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This is great news. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, and you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ with your life, then you are not condemned by God. You're not condemned. There's no condemnation. There's no price to pay for your sin. There is no eternal damnation for you. There's no hell for you in your future. Um, So how do we yawn through that? I I mean, seriously, you know, and I've been in churches uh, my whole life, and, and that good news is shared, and how do we not rejoice? I mean, we've been forgiven. We've, we've, the, the slate has been wiped clean, not because of anything we did, but because God sent Jesus into this world as a man to take your sin and my sin and to suffer on the cross for us. And because of Jesus, we're not condemned any way, shape, or form. So yeah, celebrate. Because that news, that good news ought to change our lives. It ought to change everything about us. It ought to change us in how we feel, how we see the world, how we see other people, because you know, this is great news. And getting to this point has been kind of painful. If you've been following along for seven chapters, the Apostle Paul has been telling us how horrible and hopeless we are. I mean, for seven chapters, he said, hey, we exchanged the truth of God for a lie. We judged others while we were guilty of doing the sins that we judged them for. There is no one righteous, not even one. All of us die because all of us sin. And even when we want to do right, we fail. 
Seven chapters of basically the, the Apostle Paul saying, I suck, you suck, we all suck. <laughs> okay? That's who we are. This is where we are. And, and it's been terrible. Yes, there were, there were glimpses of hope woven through there, right? In chapter 1, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. In, in chapter 3, he, he said, look, the righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There's no distinction for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In chapter 5, he said, look, God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. In chapter 6, he reminds us that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But it's been pretty much hopeless, despair, until he gets to this amazing declaration. Chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation. None whatsoever for those who are in Christ Jesus. I deserve judgment. I deserve death. I deserve hell. And I'm not going to get it. You deserve judgment. You deserve death. You deserve hell. But you're not going to get it. I mean, we're guilty. We're condemned. And yet, because of Jesus... Because of his sacrifice on the cross, because of him taking your sins and my sins upon himself. Scripture says literally he became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. So because of Jesus, we are forgiven. We are redeemed. We are accepted by God. We're adopted as his children. We're empowered as his servants. We are promised heaven for our future. This is the greatest news in the history of the earth. Do you know this? Do, do you know this? Has this come to a, a reality in your life? And, I, and I'm asking this because th this is the key question. I, and I know that most of us in this room agree with that, all those statements in our mind. But do you understand this in your soul? Have you grasped this in your heart? In, in the depth of your being, has it transformed who you are? And I, and I ask this because there's, there's so many who struggle with guilt. There's so many times that the enemy brings up shame from the past. Remember when you did this. Remember how you failed in this way. Remember when you screwed up this way. You're a failure. You're, you're guilty. And I'm not talking about what you did last night. You know, that's conviction. You need to repent of that, okay? Uh, I'm talking about, you know, last year, five years ago, 10 years ago, 30 years ago. The stuff that, that the enemy brings up and reminds you, hey, remember when you did this? Remember how you failed? You're guilty. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Do you know what God says about that? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No, that, that stuff, that, by the way, that's not God bringing that stuff up. That's Satan bringing that stuff up because he wants to steal your joy in the moment by reminding you of the failures of the past. And what Paul is telling us is that the failures of the past Covered by Jesus. By the way, your failures of the future, covered by Jesus. That's what grace is. It's amazing. It's wonderful. It's awesome. It's transformative. So do you know this? Is it real in your life? Because as the passage continues, Paul shares this tremendous contrast in viewpoints. So let's read on, picking up at verse 5, as we look at the question, what is your mindset? What is your mindset? Paul says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set their mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. What's your mindset? A mindset on the flesh or the mindset on the spirit? Now, we're in church, so I know you guys get the right answer, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, we're, our mind's set on the spirit. But really, honestly, where's our mind? Do you desire what God desires? Do you want the things that God wants? Do, do you want for you and your family what God wants for you and your family? Or are you just focused on the stuff you want? You don't care about what God thinks, and you don't care, you know, as much about your family as long as you get your way, as long as you're happy. You don't care about anyone else. I mean, honestly, it, you know, this is where it gets real, where we go, okay, wh where's my mind at? 
Because the mindset on flesh is death. The mindset on the spirit is life and peace. What kind of fruit is your life producing? Because it's leading one way or the other. And I know we can protest. We can say, hey, but you know, I'm not hostile to God. I'm pro-God. Just check my bumper and my Facebook. You can see how, how much I'm, I'm pro-God. But do you notice how Paul defines hostility toward God? Look at verse 7 again. He says, for the mind that is set, set on the flesh is hostile to God. And none of us, we're, I'm not hostile to God. But he describes it. For it does not submit to God's law. Hostility to God is defined in the text as disobedience and defiance. Disobedience and defiance. I don't care what God says. I'm going to do what I want anyway. I don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to do what I want anyway. And, and what is your mindset? Uh, really. And here's the, here's the question that really matters, I guess. What do you want your mindset to be? Is there anybody who really wants a mindset on the flesh that leads to death? Any, any takers on that? See, I, you know that. So who wants a mind that's set on the Spirit that results in life and peace? Yeah, see, we all say we want life and peace. We say it. We're so good at saying it. But are we making the choices? Are, are we making the decisions that lead to that place? So I'm assuming most of us really would like life and peace. So let's talk about the Spirit-focused mind. Spirit-focused mind. Let's continue reading. Uh, finish out this passage, verses 9 through 11. He says, You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. And Paul says, hey, let's talk about the Spirit-focused mind. And, and you can do this if there's relationship with Christ. Notice that check, that that. Again, he kind of qualifies it, and he says, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. So do you know that the Holy Spirit of God lives in you? Because the way this works is the moment you confess Jesus as Lord, the moment you surrender your life to his control, God the Holy Spirit moves into your life, and he claims you as property belonging to God. He writes the name of Jesus on your soul. He begins right away to convict of sin, to teach truth, to provide comfort in your sorrow, uh, to try to shape your life and lead your life to health and hope and peace. That, that's where he's trying to take us. And, and, and the question is, do you know that the Holy Spirit of God is in you? Now, let me just pause, because if you don't know that the Holy Spirit of God is in your life, then uh, please don't leave here today, because either you've never made a commitment to follow Jesus as Savior and Lord, and we'd love for you to talk to one of our prayer team members or one of our pastors at the Connection Centers, or you just really don't understand how to listen to the Spirit, how to know that the Spirit's there, what Scripture says about it. But, uh, uh, but that's something that, that comes with that certainty that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. But if you know that the Spirit is in you, if you know that you belong to Christ, if you know there's no condemnation in Jesus for you, then Paul's saying you can live a life with a mindset on the Spirit. He says the same Spirit is in you that raised Jesus from the dead. So this is possible. You know, even though seven chapters of, hey, we're all a mess, he says, but it's changed because of Jesus, because of the life that's in you, because of the Spirit that inhabits you. But what does that life look like? How do we get there? I want to share some thoughts with you. And, and I, I got to qualify this because I want you to hear this as a pattern, not a prescription. I want you to hear this as counsel, not as uh, check the box, here's how to become a super Christian. Because there's no you know, spiritual uh, magic pill that you can take that will make you mature in Christ. Uh, there's no step-by-step -step process that, that will work. Uh, and, and oftentimes, this is where churches go off the rails with legalism. 
And, and I'm just going to be really blunt. This is where a lot of the churches I grew up in went off the rails when it came to legalism because they would preach, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Celebrate grace. And then they would turn around and ask you to live the law. Because what they'd say is, okay, now that we're celebrating grace, here's what you have to do to have a mindset on the Spirit. They didn't use those words. Here's what you have to do to be a good Christian. Here's what you have to do to be a disciple. And then they start making demands. You have to do this and this and this, and you can't do this and this and this. Right? I'm sure some of you have been there too. And if you haven't, then praise God. Uh, because there's nothing more frustrating than celebrating grace and trying to live the law, trying to be legalistic, because legalism steals the joy. And so we, you know, we celebrate the fact that there's no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus, but then we turn around and we're like, oh, but I failed because I can't keep the law. Yeah, Paul just spent seven chapters telling us we can't keep the law. We can't do it. We can't live up to these standards. So, so I'm not going to give you, okay, if you do A, B, and C, then you'll be, you'll be happy. No, it's, it doesn't work that way. What I'm going to share with you is habits, that the more that you lean into those habits, the more that your life in Christ is going to grow, the more that you're going to be spirit-focused in your mindset, and the more life and peace you're going to have. And, and if you ignore them, then you do so at your own peril. So I just want to talk about these. And by the way, uh, I'm going to talk about these over and over and over again in the future so that, that we can, I'm just going to encourage you to go ahead and memorize them now. How's that? Uh, just let them, let them resonate now. Because what they really serve as is an evaluation tool for us to say, God, how am I doing? How am I doing? Am I following you the way that you want, or, or am, I, am I not? And by the way, God doesn't expect us to be perfect. God expects improvement. He expects progress. He expects us to take the next step on that journey following him. And, and so uh, this is a way that you can kind of look at your life and go, hey, how am I doing? How am I really doing? So first of all, if we're going to have a spirit-focused mindset, we've got to love God got to love God. Now, that's a no-brainer. We're like, yeah, we love God. We just sang songs about it, how much we love God and, and how much we love Jesus. And, and it's, it, obviously, we love God. We're in church. And we know that Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. That's why we call it the great commandment. Love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. So we know that. Um, and, and a lot of times we try to express our love in, in all kinds of ways. We tell people we love God. We tell God we love him. We, you know, maybe get expressive when we're worshiping because worship is a great way of expressing our love for God. But do you know the, the primary way that Jesus asks us to show our love to him? It's not an enthusiastic worship. It's not even in showing up in church. He said this, John chapter 14. If you love me, keep my commands. If you love me, keep my commands. If you love me, obey me. That's, that's the real test of love. Uh, so let me just ask you this. Uh, if a husband declares that he loves his wife and, and then he, he beats her, abuses her, does he really love her? Because we're not nearly as enthusiastic about that answer as I expected. Do I need to preach a different kind of sermon? Let's try this again. So if a husband says, I love you, and then beats the crap out of you, does he love you? No. Okay, that's, that's the correct answer. No, obviously he doesn't. And how many times, though, does that happen? And you, oh, I really love you, and I'm really sorry. No, you don't. You proved it by your actions. If a wife says to her husband, I love you, and then she goes and cheats on him, does she love him? No. no. Hey, if parents say, kids, we love you, but then they neglect their kids because they're too busy, whether it's with their addictions or with their, you know, screen time or whatever, do they really love them? No, no we got less enthusiastic there, didn't we? It's like, oh, crap. So we can say that we love God, but God really kind of is watching for how we do with that whole obedience thing. He really is. And it's easy to say something. It's much more difficult to actually live out the commitment. Um, so, are you loving God or are you just saying it? And how's that relationship growing? So, if we're going to have a spirit-focused mindset, we've got to love God, and, and then we've got to learn the Bible. We've got to learn the Bible. Jesus said, if you remain in my word, then you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You've got to remain in my word. 
Um, the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he said, all scripture is God breathed. Literally, it comes out of the essence of God. And it's profitable for teaching, correcting, rebuking, training in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, if we're going to have a mind that is set on the Spirit, we actually have to know what God thinks. We have to know what He says. We have to, to, to become intimate with His mind, and that's why He gave us the Bible. Here at Calvary, we believe the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. So if you're going to love God, you might want to figure out what he thinks. Because that's how the Spirit is going to lead you into truth. The reality is, if we don't know the truth, we're going to live a lie. So it's about knowledge. And by the way, in relationships, relationships are based in, in knowledge. So how many of you that are married... If you go to a restaurant, you could order for your spouse. Yeah, you can do that because you know them. How many of you could, but you're, you'd be afraid to? <laughs> ah, okay, see. See, I, I, I can relate to that. Uh, but, uh, but see, here's the thing. We know because we spend time with them, and you get to know them, and you understand what they like and what they don't like and, and how they see the world and, <laughs> and what they value. And so the way that we can spend time with God where we can know him, we know what his values are, we know what his delights are, and we know what he likes and what he doesn't like is this book, which, by the way, is why we give them away. And we're serious about that. If you want a Bible and you don't have a Bible, then please take one of these because we know that the key to understanding God and, and learning him and pleasing him is wrapped up in knowing his truth. And as I said before, if you don't know the truth, if you don't know the word of God, you're going to live a lie. It's going to lead to death. So if we're going to keep our mind focused on the spirit, leading in life and peace, and we've got to love God, we've got to learn the Bible, and then we've got to live the character of Jesus. Live the character of Jesus. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 said, Be imitators of God as dearly loved children. Be imitators of God as dearly loved children. Now think about that for a minute. What do children tend to do toward their parents? They, they imitate them, don't they? I mean, that whole do as I say, not as I do thing, does that work? No. Why? Because kids want to be like their parents. You know, because they're too young to know better. Uh, and... Uh, and I don't know about you, but as a parent and now as a grandparent, when I see, uh, you know, my kids or my grandkids imitating what I'm doing, it, it makes me pause. So I've corrupted my grandson, Eli, because uh, he wants to drink Diet Pepsi because Papa drinks Diet Pepsi. And, and so when I have one, I stare it. <laughs> I hold it, and he wants to, and so, and the kid drinks it. I'm like, you don't like that, do you? Mmm, it's delicious. No, it's not. You just don't know any better, and so I have to like, drink a lot more water when I'm around him now. And, uh, and, and that's just, it's honest, because kids want to imitate mom and dad. And, and Paul is saying, look, I want us, as followers of Jesus, to imitate our Heavenly Father. Jesus put it this way, John 13. He said, by this all men will know that you're my disciples, if you love one another. By the way you love each other, people are going to know that you belong to me because we have to live the character of Jesus if our mind is going to be focused on the Spirit because it doesn't matter how much you know if you're not putting it into practice. In fact, the Apostle Paul said that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So do people see Jesus in your life? Do they see Jesus in your family, the way that you treat your family? Do they see Jesus in your work ethic? Do they see Jesus in the way that you treat people? And I know that in, in uh, the churches I grew up in, the, the character part was just about the big no-nos. Don't do the big no-nos. And they avoided or ignored, uh, never addressed the, the small moments of how you treat people. But, but people don't really care about the big no-nos if you're treating them poorly. Because they don't even have to ask. The other questions. It's a both and. We've got to care about how people uh, see us and understand that we're living out the character of Jesus. So do people see Jesus in you in the way that you forgive? Or are you holding on to those grudges and those hurts and you're bringing them up over and over and over again? 
You see, we cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. Because when we don't live the character of Jesus, when we claim to love Jesus, we're just practicing hypocrisy. Again, God doesn't expect perfection. He expects improvement. So are you growing in the character of Christ? Because if we're going to have a mindset on the Spirit, we've got to live the character of Jesus. We've got to learn the Bible. We've got to love God. And we've got to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. This is the mission of Calvary. Uh, by the way, this was Jesus' mission. He worded it differently. He said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. He gave us the great commission in Matthew 28 when he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. You see, we understand the mission. So here at Calvary, the mission is why we do the stuff we do. You want to know why we do anything? It goes back to this idea of leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's our mission. It's why we uh, uh, celebrate camp season. Well, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we just uh, finished camp season. And uh, I say that. We had about six weeks where we sent kids to five different camps. Uh, and a lot of you invested a lot of money in that. You, you sponsored kids. You scholarshiped kids. You, you supported that uh, endeavor as it went. We invest a lot as a church in that. And some people go, why do you spend so much money? You got, you know, children's director, a junior high pastor, a high school pastor. You got all this different stuff. Why do you spend all that money? Well, here's the why. We had like 339 kids go to these different camps. We had 34 decisions for Christ. Yeah. Out of those 34 decisions for Christ, 21 of them have already been baptized, declaring their faith publicly in Jesus. Yeah. You see... And, and you guys help make it possible because you are the ones who, who invested in them, whether it's just by simply supporting what the church does, by your tithes and offerings, or it's by sponsoring specific kids or just saying, hey, I want to see a bunch of kids go to camp. It doesn't matter. The, the, the reality is that that's life change. And, and we're doing something actively to lead people to life change. And, and in this season, it gets to be kids at camp. And we always want to see kids make decisions for Christ. But this is kind of an intense time of life change. So it's why we do what we do. It's why we send mission teams out around the world. It's, it's why we do car shows and serve our schools and, and all the different things of Calvary. It's because we want to lead people to that life-changing relationship with Jesus. Because it was Jesus' mission and it's our mission. Is it your mission? Is it important to you? Does it ever cross your mind? Are, are you supporting the mission of life change? Are you encouraging people? Are you investing in people? Are you serving in some way to help support that mission? More importantly, who is it in your life that you want to lead to that life-changing relationship with Jesus that you're praying for, that you're inviting, that you're encouraging? Because if we're going to have a mind set on the Spirit, then leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus is part of it. So is your mind set on the Spirit? I mean, if you want it to be, then you're probably like me, where you're doing pretty well in some areas, and you're kind of complacent in some others, and they need some attention. So what patterns do you need to change or develop in your life? To have a mind that is set on the Spirit. Is it loving God? Is it learning the Bible? Is it living the character of Jesus? Is it leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus? Because the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. So this is a life and death decision. My prayer is that you would choose wisely. Will you pray with me?